Good morning, this is Andy, and welcome to our Sunday morning Step Closer teaching on April 5th, uh, 2020. And this is, I think, uh, pretty obviously a very challenging time in history with the coronavirus uh, wreaking havoc around the world. And this past week, um, that all became very personal. As I think many of you are aware, our dear brother uh, Bruce Mays uh, tested positive for uh, COVID-19. That he'd been you know, battling a fever uh, for a period of time. The doctor thought it was uh, the regular flu, so the doctor prescribed Tamiflu. But last Sunday afternoon, uh, Bruce began experiencing shortness of breath, and the doctor uh, said to immediately uh, go to the emergency room. Uh, Bruce then was admitted to the hospital uh, down at Kaiser in Santa Clara and has been basically uh, fighting for his life. Uh, thankfully, he's doing a bit better, but it has been very hard, and it looks like it's going to be uh, a long journey ahead. And so I'd like to actually start today by praying for Bruce and for his um, beloved wife, Lucy. Obviously, if you're married, you're not going through this alone. Yeah, Bruce is suffering, but in some sense, Bruce and Lucy are a four-legged creature going through life together. So let me open with a word of prayer for both uh, Bruce and, and, and Lucy. Lord, I do thank you uh, for, for Bruce, and I pray even now. You are the great physician, Lord, and so we cry out to you uh, for healing. We pray that you would uh, spare Bruce's life, and not only that, Lord, but would restore him to full health. Watch over uh, Lucy as well, as I know she is uh, going through it, uh, Lord, seeing her husband in such uh, extreme illness. So watch over them and the Lord help the others, uh, so many that are suffering right now from the virus. Please bring this illness uh, to its knees. Heal our nation. We do pray though too you would help us to look for opportunities in the midst of this time. I know you're seeking to make yourself known. So please Lord uh, use this time to reach out to a lost, broken, and hurting world that so desperately needs you. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Well, to switch gears, even though Bruce is uh, heavy on my uh, on my heart, um, I think uh, most of you know we are currently uh, going through Paul's letter uh, to the Corinthians. We're going through 1 Corinthians right now, later, Lord willing, we'll get to uh, 2 Corinthians. And uh, last week, Dave Thorne did a wonderful teaching on uh, 1 Corinthians 8, and today I'll be uh, doing... 1 Corinthians 9. But last week, Dave taught us on a, a subject that I think probably most folks found a little bit, what in the world does that have to do with me? It seems like it has no uh, personal application, which is to say the Corinthians had apparently written to Paul and with some questions. Uh, they'd asked him earlier back in chapter 7, some questions about marriage. They'd also asked him about meat sacrificed to idols. Now, to the best of my knowledge, um, at least in a literal sense, uh, there are no temples around where they sacrifice animals and then eat the meat and the today. But back in Corinth, they would uh, sacrifice animals and then they'd sell uh, the meat at the, at the local meat market. And so the Corinthians were saying, well, should we eat this meat uh, that's been sacrificed uh, to, to idols? And, and Paul said, look, okay, look, you have that right. You have you can do that because basically it's just meat. Meat is meat. Who you know if it's sacrificed to an idol or not, it doesn't matter. You have that right, but you need to start considering how others might view that behavior if you exercise that right. Perhaps you know somebody from a pagan temple will see you and think, oh, you're one of us. You're part of uh, my pagan temple. Or maybe a new believer will see you eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And that new believer will go, oh no, that brother in Christ is still tangled up in pagan religion. So the real question is not so much about you exercising your rights, but if people perceive you and their faith is damaged, 
then you should refrain from exercising uh, your right. It's not about you. It's ultimately about Jesus seeking to make himself known. And if exercising your rights helps to draw people to Christ, great. But if exercising your rights might damage the faith of someone else, then don't exercise your right. Don't eat the meat uh, sacrificed to idols. Now, this in some ways goes very counterculture to the world in which uh, we're, uh, we're living. Uh, this is a culture that is all about your rights. I was reading Ray Steadman on this. You know, We live in a culture, it's my rights. Nobody infringes on my rights. I'm never going to refrain from you know, exercising uh, my rights. Now, maybe a bit later I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I think our culture is confusing appetites with rights. I think somebody said that at some point. People confuse uh, their rights and their appetites. They think just because they have an appetite, just because they have a desire, just because they have a craving, that they therefore have a right to satisfy and gratify that particular appetite or craving or desire. And so people in our culture always want their rights, always want to exercise their rights, but really in many cases they're also confusing their appetites and trying to make them into something more noble uh, than they really are. Now, perhaps we'll talk later about, about that. But uh, Dave gave this wonderful example. Um, I don't think it was wonderful to go through, but it was a wonderful example of one time going to a fast food uh, restaurant. And, uh, you know, he got his tray of food, sits down at a table. Some other guy comes up with a tray and goes, you're sitting at my table. Didn't you see my backpack? You know, blah, 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 blah. And it was all, I think Dave used the word uh, nasty. And then the guy goes and sits at another table and bows his head and starts to pray. <laughs> and, you know, Dave goes, what a hypocrite. You know, here he is acting like he's a follower of Jesus. And he's going, my rights were infringed upon. And he starts unloading on, on, on Dave. So, yeah, maybe the guy did have a right to that seat. But the way he exercised uh, that right uh, was not a good witness of, of Christ. And, and that was actually, uh, I would say, somewhat convicting to me as I was uh, searching through my own memories of um, uh, one time when we were doing church planting in Berkeley back in 1980, 80 to 86. Um, you know, I took the kids out to the, the park. Um, you know, they were, I don't know, two, four, and six. We had three kids. And we're at the park, and this uh, guy is there with his dog, and the dog is not on a leash. And the rule is, if you're there, you have to have your dog on a leash. Well, the dog comes up and is very aggressive and barking. And I'm grabbing my kids, trying to protect them from this barking dog. And the owner comes up, and I just unload on the guy. What are you doing? It is my right to be able to come here with my kids. And you need to be following the laws. And what? Look at my kids. How you up? You know, blah, 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 blah. Well, I leave. And uh, I start thinking to myself, you know what? That guy is going to show up in my Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, he didn't. He didn't. But I was really praying about it. And a couple weeks later, uh, I was outside working on our house, painting the house. And I looked down and here's the guy walking on the sidewalk in front of uh, uh, my house with his dog, still not on a leash. And I, I yelled down. I go, hey, hey, man, you remember, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, I really chewed you out. I am so sorry, man. I just really blew it. Please forgive me. I am so sorry, you know, making amends. And the guy's, oh, no big deal, man, not a problem, not a problem. But I realized, you know, I may have had the right to have my kids at the park and not be accosted by some, um, you know, mean dog. Uh, but the way I chose to exercise that right was not a, a good witness of Christ. So the point Paul was making in chapter 8, and then he's now going to continue in chapter 9, is that, even if you have rights, it's really more about whether exercising your rights is going to bless somebody else or not. Okay. Are your rights more important than somebody else's being blessed? And the answer is no. There are times to set your rights aside if it would, in fact, bless somebody else. Now, what he's going to start saying here is, look, I'm an apostle. And he's going to say, I have certain rights as an apostle. And kind of spoiler alert, most of what we're going through is, I've got my rights as an apostle. And let me prove to you, I've got rights as an apostle. 
But the spoiler alert is at the end, he's going to say, even though I have those rights, I'm not going to exercise them because I don't think that would bless uh, you. So he's going to shift it from this discussion about the right to eat meat or not eat meat or whatever, and he's now going to shift it over to talking uh, about himself. So he says in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He says, look, am I an apostle? Of course I'm an apostle. He says, I have seen the risen Lord. The idea is Jesus appointed me to be an apostle. That's what, what Paul is saying. He didn't, he didn't, he's not some self-appointed apostle. He hasn't conferred this office on himself. God appointed him. Now, if you're in the military, let's say, let, let's say I go to a military base and I start telling everybody I'm a general. <laughs> you know, I've never been in the military. If I start walking around, everybody's going, you know what? The only way you become a general is if some superior authority commissions you, appoints you, gives you that office, right? If you're just a self-appointed person going around, you've got no authority and you've got none of the rights that go along with that position of authority, of being a general or whatever it happens to be. You need to be appointed by a superior authority. Rights come from a superior authority. The writers of the Declaration of Independence, or the signers, Jefferson wrote it, but the signers, it says in there, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Among them, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They are each person is endowed by their creator with certain rights. The founders of this country recognize this. You just don't make up, right? I've got rights. I've got rights. Has God given you that right? If it comes from an authority greater than yourself, then you have that right. If it's just self-manufactured, it's like me walking around claiming to be a general. There's nothing to it. It's just delusional thinking. Okay. Now, Paul... You know, if we look in, in Scripture, in Acts 26, um, it's like, well, okay, so Paul claims that he, was a, he saw the risen Lord and by implication was appointed to be an apostle. Um, in Acts 26, Paul is uh, giving his testimony, making his defense before Festus, the Roman governor, and King Agrippa, uh, the Jewish uh, king, and in the course of that, he recounts when he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. And at that point, the Lord said to him, I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins in a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. He says, I have delivered you from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. The word sending in Greek is the word apostolo. Uh, from which we derive our word apostle. Apostle means to be sent. You have been commissioned. The Lord himself commissioned Paul to go to the Gentiles. Paul says, look, I have seen the risen Lord, and he told me <laughs> to go. He gave me the authority, and I also, as we'll find out in a minute, now have rights because I have a position that was given to me by the Lord. He also says, look, are you not my workmanship? The idea, and I think Ray Stedman uh, brought this out, the idea is if you really have been commissioned by God, if you really have been appointed by God, your ministry will have fruit. There will be something that comes from it that is godly. 
uh, Jesus says back in uh, the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7, uh, talking about good and, good and bad teachers, uh, he says, you will know them by their fruit. A, a good tree does not bear bad fruit, and a diseased tree does not bear good fruit. It may not, you may not see it over time. People may claim to be uh, ministers of the gospel. They may look pretty good for a while, but over time, they will bear a certain kind of fruit. If they are a true teacher come from God, that ministry will bear good fruit. If they are a false prophet and a false teacher, that ministry over time will bear bad fruit. And Paul's saying, look, I was appointed by God, but guess what? My ministry has borne fruit. And then he says to them, if, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, which is to say you guys are part of the fruit that has come from this ministry. He says, I may not be an apostle. Other people may not see me as an apostle, but you should because you're part of the fruit of the apostolic ministry uh, that was uh, given to me. That's what Paul is uh, telling the, the Corinthians. Okay, so it's an interesting uh, kind of thing. He's starting and saying, look, you know, I am, I'm an apostle. The Lord appointed me. My ministry has borne fruit. Now he's going to shift a bit. And he's going to say, well, there's probably other people that are going to argue with that position. Or they may argue that I have rights because I'm an apostle. Uh, I think Ray Steadman said a lot of times... Uh, uh, sometimes pr people want to look at preachers as parasites. <laughs> you know, you're, uh, you're just kind of sucking money out of people's uh, pocket. And, uh, you know, maybe a bit later I'll talk in, in greater detail because I do think there are some people who masquerade as uh, ministers of the gospel who are really uh, not. But he's shifting now and he's going to say, listen, with my apostleship, there comes certain rights, even though people may argue whether I'm an apostle or not. He says in verse uh, 3, this is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living. He says, look, <clears throat> do we have the right to eat and drink? Of course we do. It's kind of like, it's just plain as the nose on your face. We have the right to material support. If we are apostles, if we've come and our ministry has borne fruit among you, then we have the right to be uh, materially supported. It should be as plain as the nose on your face. Now, you know, this <laughs> particular nose of mine, you know, <clears throat> it may just seem like it showed up on my face, uh, but it's actually a family nose. My mother's got this nose and, and uh, her uh, grandmother had it. So, but he's saying, look, it should be as plain as the nose on, on your face that if you have been appointed by God, your work is bearing fruit, uh, that you have the right to eat and drink, to be uh, materially uh, supported by the fruit that comes from uh, that uh, ministry. And he says, do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles? Now, he's single, but what he's trying to say is, look, this applies not just to single guys. He goes on to say, like, you know, Barnabas and me, we're single guys. It isn't just you should support single guys who are uh, ministers of the gospel, but you should support the person and their family, right? So he says, if one of these, if these apostles are bringing along a believing wife and a kids, well, then it isn't like you just provide enough money for the the, you know, the dad to eat. Uh, it should be that the family is provided for uh, as well by the church. Now, the interesting uh, point here in this passage, as he talks about. Um, uh, brothers with believing wives, and he talks the other apostles, and Cephas. And Cephas is the Aramaic name for uh, Peter, which is to say, <clears throat> this is clear from Scripture that Peter was married. 
Now, you know, I don't want to get into a whole lot of, you know, church um, disagreements. Um, but when the Catholic Church insists that priests and nuns uh, not marry, and they trace a lot of the church back to, you know, Peter is the first pope, it says here clearly that Peter was married. And my belief is that Scripture does not insist upon uh, either priests or nuns remaining single. If you're a minister of the gospel, it is okay to be married, and it is also okay to expect that the church should then uh, support both the person and, uh, and the family. Okay. So now he's going to shift, and he's going to give what I call some... Um, kind of some examples from everyday life. He's going to say, look, you, should, you guys can see this just from the way uh, things work in the world. And then he's going to also give uh, an example to give it a scriptural basis. So he should go, just from your everyday experience, you should know this, that if, 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 you know, if you're working, you should be able to reap some of the fruit from the work. Uh, but scripture also teaches uh, the same thing. So let me read uh, starting uh, at verse 7. He says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of, the, of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox as it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does not <clears throat> he certainly speak uh, for our sake, it was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on, on you, do not we even more? He says, you know, you look at, uh, you look at soldiers you look at uh, people or farmers, you look at uh, shepherds. He says, look, a soldier doesn't go to war paying his own way, right? That soldier goes out there and then other people support that soldier. And in different places in scripture, Paul likens that himself. I'm a soldier, you know, fighting the, fighting the good fight of faith and tells us take on the full armor of God. You know, take on the full armor. So he says, look, I'm a soldier. He says, it's like I'm a farmer. I'm planting. Of course, a farmer who plants gets to eat some of the fruit. Of course, a shepherd who takes care of the flock gets to drink some of the milk from the flock. You know, the word pastor, by the way, means shepherd. That's what a pastor is uh, supposed to do, is shepherd uh, the flock of God. Now, as I said earlier, I do believe that there are uh, false teachers out there. It says um, in 2 Corinthians, Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. Is it no wonder that his ministers disguise themselves as uh, angels of uh, righteousness? So there are people out there you know, on television or whatever. They're, now, God knows what their heart is, but the appearance is they're more interested in fleecing the flock than in feeding the flock. They want your money more than they care about you, and they'll make all these grandiose, oh, just, you know, to the little old lady, give me your social security check, and God will, you know, you know, and so they're trying to rip you off, and, and it says in Peter, as a matter of fact, I was looking at this this morning, talking about these sorts of uh, religious, uh, you know, rip-off artists, con artists, he says, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. There are people, Satan has no qualms about dressing up in religious clothing in order to rip you off. There really are people out there who say, I'm a minister of the gospel, but really they just want your money. They don't care about you. Now, if you have uh, somehow felt that there is a person who is just after your money, well, first of all, I, I urge you to pray for that person. Uh, but secondly, do not remain in a place where people don't care about you. Do not contribute to a ministry where you figure they really do just want my money. They don't care about me at all. There are religious charlatans and hoaxers and rip-off artists 
and con men and false prophets out there. For a true minister, yes, there is a right that comes with <clears throat> that ministry, and that's the right to be supported. But make sure that it's not somebody who's just trying to fleece you uh, rather than uh, feed you. And he says this is true. Also, the law of Moses says this out of Deuteronomy. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. The idea is, look, even with oxen, you don't prevent them from eating some of the fruit of the labor there as they're plowing the field, as they're working with the, uh, the mill and making it grind uh, the wheat in, into flour. He says you don't. And he says, yeah, this applies to oxen, but he said it was really written to our sake, for our sake. You know, Warren Wearsby said, you know, oxen can't read. <laughs> you know, so... The idea is, yeah, it applies. This is the way you're supposed to take care of your animals. But there's a deeper meaning. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is given is profitable for us. What are we supposed to to learn from this? And Paul says, you know what? Uh, what you're supposed to learn is, if somebody is ministering, uh, they have a right uh, to some of the material things. It says, if we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap uh, your uh, material things. So he said, look, if your life is better as a result of the ministry, yeah, your spiritual life is better, but perhaps, you know, because your life is better, you've also, your life has borne material fruit as a result of the better life that God has uh, given to you. You know, seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be added to you if you've sought first the kingdom of God because of the ministry and you have been provided for in other ways. He says, you know what? I have that right uh, to reap some of your uh, material uh, benefits that you've had there. So, <clears throat> now to kind of conclude this off a little bit, he goes on to say, okay, he's gone through this big deal proving I'm an apostle, I've got my rights, you know, I should be able to reap uh, some of your material benefits, you know. But the larger principle, as I said earlier, it's not about exercising rights. It's about blessing other people. And so Paul says, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple and the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. So he says, listen, just to kind of reaffirm this thing, people who work in the temple, well, they, they eat of <laughs> the sacrificial offerings. He says, we see that those who serve at the altar, but he says, you know what? Nonetheless, nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. He says, look, I have this right. Yeah, even the guys who are at the Jewish temple, they eat some of the stuff from the sacrificed animals. He says, but I know that for the gospel's sake, Paul went off and he would be a tent maker. So he, he was in Corinth, he was making tents, he was working. He says, I had the right to be supported by uh, you guys. And I knew that that might damage your faith if I insisted that you give me money for uh, doing what I was doing there. And so Paul says, I set my right aside in order that uh, somehow the gospel might be more effectively communicated to you. Now, the point for each one of us is, again, in a society that is insisting so frequently on its rights and exercising its rights, we need to replace that mindset, that worldly mindset, with a godly mindset. And that mindset is, it's about Jesus making himself known. And that involves blessing other people. Sometimes we may need to set aside our, 
our rights. But the focus should not be on me and what's my rights and you're infringing on my... That's the wrong focus. The focus is, is it advancing the cause of the gospel? Is it making Jesus known? Is it brought, bringing somebody else to faith in Christ? If that's the focus, then the rights are secondary. And for each one of us, I would suggest the next time you might get in a situation where you're feeling like, well, somebody's violating my rights, or I have the right to do this, and I, to stop for a minute and pray and say, God, I do have this right. But what is going to help to draw this person to faith, to strengthen them in their faith, to encourage them in the faith? And if it involves me setting my own rights aside, help me to do that by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let me pray. Lord, I do thank you uh, for this passage. I thank you for the message that, yes, we do have rights, Lord. And yet there are times when you are asking us not to exercise those rights if it would be a blessing to someone else. You say that by this all men shall know you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And help that love to be genuine, Lord, that selfless, self-sacrificial love, whereby you're drawing lost, broken, and hurting men and women to yourself. And I pray this in Jesus' name.